We're on location from Cambridge, England, and we have come for a conference on minimally invasive spinal surgeries. Joining us is Dr. Michael Merriweather and Dr. Lawrence Fink. Dr. Fink, who would be some of the presenters here? We've been uh, surrounded by a virtual galaxy of superstars in spinal surgery from around the world. Um, if I had to name a few, I would single out uh, Mario Brock, a professor of neurosurgery at uh, Berlin, um, several people, Michel Benoit and others from uh, Paris, uh, Thomas Hoogland from uh, Munich, Michael Sullivan from here in Cambridge, uh, Tony Young, Phoenix, Arizona, and John Thalgott from Las Vegas, Nevada, Hal Matthews from Richmond, Virginia, just to name really a few, Ross Wilkie uh, from Australia, uh, and we've been uh, among honored guests at this society and it's been really exciting to be with them and to be with our colleagues. Dr. Merriweather, what are the types of procedures that are being presented? Well, there are quite a few and they are um, procedures involving endoscopic and percutaneous techniques uh, as well as the use of open surgeries. Um, the basis uh, for the conference is on minimally invasive, making the smallest possible incision with the use of new technology including uh, uh, coagulation devices, the use of the laser, percutaneous instruments, etc. to to make the, the spinal uh, surgeon have the latest uh, available techniques at his disposal. Dr. Fink, what would the significance of these procedures be? The significance of the procedures is really a validation of what we've talked about uh, over the past several years, and that is, first and foremost, to do the least harm to the patient while providing for the patient the most benefit. That's an easy concept to enunciate, but a difficult one to achieve. And one of the goals of this meeting is to share notes, uh, to share experiences uh, between those of us who are doing a lot of this type of work, a lot of uh, leading edge technology in minimally invasive surgery, to compare notes and results and to see what we can do to further improve our results, uh, further enhance the results for our patients, uh, and to further improve their lives. I've been attending these sessions and I found it quite interesting the information that is being presented but I've also found it interesting the discussion sessions that come up after the fact. Uh, I find that you're not always in agreement but you certainly have an ability to talk to one another and to discuss and I think learn from one another. Uh, what is the significance of this to you as doctors? Well, I think it's the basis for all education and learning is the ability to um, ag agree to disagree in a collegial way, not in an adversarial way, but we are all uh, often more prisoners than we are products of our training and background. And quite frankly, it's important that we uh, learn to discuss things openly and learn to uh, learn from our, our partners' mistakes and, and uh, accomplishments. I think debate, Michael, is, is absolutely essential. Uh, by debating a point, I think we can elicit the nucleus of, of the material and try to figure out exactly what it is that, uh, that unites us and what it is that divides us to be sure we're talking about the same things. Uh, we have, uh, if you will, arguments simply about terminology because if we can't agree on what it is that we're calling something, then it's difficult to agree on what it is we're talking about. I, I would just like to add that, that in this uh, incredible um, university here, sort of a bastion of, of Western uh, liberal education and, and arts and sciences, um, we're reminded of the, of the fact that we do stand on the shoulders of giants, many people who have gone before us who have paved the way. It's very important at this point that uh, we look at that I'm also reminded of Hegel, the great philosopher, who said that uh, all eventual thought com is comprised initially of a thesis, then there's an antithesis or antithesis, and they combine together to form a synthesis. I would go back to something that Tony Young said the other day, which I think uh, encapsulates the whole concept of the debate. And he noted that those who do not move along these paths, which are chosen both by advances in science and technology and by advances in patient education, in paying attention to what the patients want. Those who do not join that will be left behind. Uh, part of what we have tried to do with our patients and our practices, as well as to some extent through these programs, uh, have been to educate the patient population so that all of us understand what's available out there today, what the state of the art is, what can be achieved. 
and to work together to try to get the best results for our patients uh, and for all of us to move forward uh, in terms of scientific achievement and in uh, patient satisfaction. Dr. Fink, you presented two papers here comprised of information that you and Dr. Merriweather have compiled over the years. Uh, what are those procedures? The first paper I presented was on the use of the ray threaded fusion cage, which is a relatively minimally invasive procedure to achieve stabilization and fusion in the lumbar spine, the, the lower back, if you will. The other paper was on our use of coral for anterior cervical fusions, and I would note that, as far as I can tell, we have the largest series now in publication. Uh, our results in both of these have been excellent. Our patient selection has played a major role in that. Uh, analyzing our results and choosing our patients appropriately have helped our results. Uh, and I think that we have done well with both. And as I noted earlier, we've had um, approval from our colleagues, and that's very gratifying. Dr. Merriweather, what was the criteria for acceptance of the papers? Well, I, I think it's new work, and it uh, involves significant numbers of patients and has significantly positive results. Uh, I might add, for example, Dr. John Thalgott from Las Vegas, who has been a pioneer in the development of the use of the brain coral uh, medical grade coral for cervical and lumbar surgery has had just published this month in Spine Journal uh, a series of cervical fusions which is uh, a very nice paper but comprises basically about a fifth of the number of cases that we've uh, uh, presented for for the conference here uh, at Cambridge. I might add it was uh, his advice and, and mentoring that got me into using the coral initially so it's rather interesting sometimes that uh, that uh, we can set uh, someone off on a certain tangent and, and they maybe go a little further down the road than the original um, inventor of the idea. But uh, as Dr. Fink said, the papers have been very well received. Um, uh, we're very excited to be in the company of these people and to share our thoughts and be accepted uh, in a very collegial way with uh, the other members of the society. The bottom line is this is, if you will, a ticket of admission. Um, you have to be vetted, as they would say in England, you have to be able to pass certain fairly stringent selection criteria in order to have a paper accepted. Uh, your work has to be acceptable, the way in which it's been presented has to be acceptable, the writing has to be acceptable, and to have the paper accepted means that the program committee uh, comprised of, of already distinguished members of the society believe that what you have to say is worth hearing. Then, uh, having gotten that step, I think it allows you then to enter into the debate, and that's why I say it's sort of a ticket of admission. Uh, if you have something worthwhile to say, if you have something worth listening to, then you have the opportunity to discuss one-on-one -on -one and in some cases debate uh, several on several, uh, conflicting or at least differing viewpoints. And that's what really makes the meeting exciting. The papers are, are fun. Uh, they're, they're a method to learn. They're a method to say, hey, look, this is what I've done and this is how I've done it but then the discussions after where there's really give and take and you get down to the nitty gritty, that's really the excitement of the meeting, that's the learning process. Dr. Fink, I know you spent many hours preparing for your presentation, working on the computer, getting the graphics just right. Exactly what was your objective? If one is honest, uh, the paper really writes itself. I set out to analyze the results of Dr. Merriweather's and my work in these two areas. Uh, anecdotally, that is just sort of looking at what we thought was happening. Anecdotally, our patient results seem to be good, our patients seem to be pleased. Uh, the results looked technically good, uh, and we enjoyed doing the procedures, which is really a significant part of the, of the entire operative procedure. Uh, if one does not like what one is doing, it's difficult to do it well. But when you go back and start looking at the results, you find all sorts of things that might not have commanded your attention as you're doing the procedure or as you're just thinking about it. And so we started analyzing our results and started to look at the technique and the technology which we had brought to bear in these procedures and found some very interesting things. Uh, we found um, variations in the types of techniques that we used. Some seemed to be more effective, some less. We found areas where we could improve. 
We found areas where we felt others might not be aware of hazards, uh, places where we had uh, managed to almost triumph, if you will, uh, in the face of potential failure. Uh, and we felt that those things should be pointed out to our colleagues. Um, the comments that we got, they appreciated those comments. Uh, they learned from them. And that, after all, is the, the fundamental basis of a meeting. For, our, for all of us really to learn from each other. Dr. Merriweather, how important are these meetings to your profession and your patients? Well, they're important, Myron, to delineate what works and what doesn't work, what's on the cutting edge, um, and, and have the input of other people who can be quite critical um, of our work as well as theirs. So, so I think it's a form of, of um, medical dissent and debate uh, and finally reaching an agreement about a procedure or, or a set of problems that needs to be solved. Very important for us in our practice to get the affirmation of what we've done and very important, important for the patients to uh, realize the results of that, which is the success of these procedures. Doctors, we've had the opportunity to hear you talking with your colleagues about their opinions of the future of minimally invasive procedures and the treatment of spinal injuries and disease. Tell us, what is your opinion of the future of this? Uh, my view is that as we get better at it, the first goal of anything medical is repair. Beyond repair, if that's not feasible, it's regeneration. And then the third is replacement. Surgery involves a lot of replacement. And I have tried to structure what we do uh, substituting biological materials uh, by synthetic materials. And that's what we've done with ray cages. That's what we've done with coral in terms of fusion, to try to bring to bear on the patient uh, the types of technologies which will be bettered and improved on over the coming generations. There are some exciting uh, things coming for the future, which we've heard some about and we're all aware. Uh, one is a new type of hormone or protein that causes bone healing called BMP2 which uh, may well completely uh, outdate all the available fusion hardware at some point. Uh, the second is hardware that's uh, actually bioresorbable, uh, which is another uh, a whole new area of technology. So exciting things are happening in the future. Uh, we don't want to be the, uh, the first to try the new or the last to abandon the old for sure, but, but I think this is the sort of milieu and environment that it's really wonderful to be a part of and to see uh, where the future of spinal surgery is going, which is minimally invasive, percutaneous, and often outpatient. Is there anything that I have not asked you that you would like to share uh, with our viewers? Yes. <laughs> yes, actually, there is. The one thing I, I think that I would want to get across to our viewers, whether they are our patients or not patients at all, and that is to realize that medical science is advancing, that we are all trying to do a better job for our patients, that you should ask questions, not the standard questions that you hear like, doctor, have you done this procedure before, or where did you go to medical school? Because the chances are everyone's done the procedures before and they've all gone to reasonable medical schools. The questions are more, what's out there? What's the best procedure for me as a patient? What are my alternatives? And why would I choose to do this or that? Doctors, I want to thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this very eventful meeting and also to take place in this very historic location. I have managed to figure out the currency, but I'm still not going to drive.